the word. Praise God, praise God. Um, um, we are going to be, uh, for the most of our time, in Galatians chapter 2. And really just uh, chopping up about four verses, but I have a feeling that these four, these four verses are going to feel like a very long time today. Um, but nevertheless, we have four main verses that we have to chop up. And um, yeah, let's open up in prayer. Um, I want to I want to give a shout out to Elder Planbeck, right? Elder Planbeck is here. Uh, one of our elders in our church. We already appreciate and love seeing his face. Um, um, so yeah, let's go ahead and pray. Then after that, we can jump right into this text and just really break the bread of God with you guys. All right. Um, this week we're covering the gospel and the great drawback, and and really what we're talking about is what is what are those things that sometimes draw our, our hearts away from the gospel? So that's really what we're talking about today. All right? So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just give you thanks, God. Our hearts, our minds, our souls, God is crying today to actually know you more and to be in a more meaningful relationship with you, God. Father God, I actually pray, God, that as we are going through scripture today, God, that you are working on our hearts, that, God, that you are pulling on our hearts and the desires that might be blocking you for us pursuing you completely, God, Father God, that you are really addressing those things, God. Father God, I actually pray, God, that right now in this moment, God, that uh, those who are watching and listening and sitting in this church, God, that you um, let the gospel be named on. That if there's any lie that has been spoken or any lie that has been taught, God, that, that your scripture, your text, d- dispute it. That, Father God, that they don't hear Justin, nor do they see Justin, or they hear and feel in your love. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 We are currently at a, a part in the series that if I was to recap the last three weeks, that would be the sermon in itself. So I'm just going to recap last week, uh, starting this week uh, going forward. I'm only going to do the previous week, uh, j- just do a quick recap. But um, let's talk about last week. Um, if you wasn't here last week or you, you want me to drop your memory, what we talked about last week is that when the gospel go forth, there's two main arguments that always come against the gospel, right? And, and, and the first argument that goes against the gospel is that if the gospel is only us putting our faith in Christ, trusting in him completely and pursuing him and pursuing him in a lifestyle that, that is motivated by love and his grace, how did we get rid of the law? Didn't the law come from God? Isn't the law good? The, he goes, the law has to be part of that equation. That's the first argument. And, and we looked at sc- scripture and also used the analogy of an MRI. This concept is that although the law is amazing and beautiful to do what it was designed to do, it is weak to give us a cure that only Jesus can provide. And it's, and it's really this idea now is that many times when people are in Christianity and they feel like they're getting beat us out of their head and they walk, it's simply because someone told them that the law was part of their equation of salvation. And, and in that, what the law is really good is telling you is that you are bad. You're short. You would never make God happy. It's, it's very good with diagnosing that you're not perfect in your heart. But the gospel tells us that Jesus has died and his perfection has been imputed unto you. I say that because sometimes you say righteousness and people don't understand what that means because it's sometimes Christian, Christianism uh, um, Christian needs is what they call it. And, and really this ideal, of a, that, this ideal of the person who never done anything wrong with God is now transmitted unto us. So when he looks at us, he doesn't see our wrong. He sees God perfection. That's the gospel. That's the, that's the argument. But there's a second argument, and this week we're going to look at the second argument. And the second argument is that if you preach gospel, people are going to do what they want to do. And we're going to try to address that today. All right. Um, 
we're going to be in, in verse 11. And, and uh, this is probably the most awkward event in Christian history. Most awkward event. And you, you're going to really see what I mean by awkward. Um, and it goes like this. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed. Uh, geography or really historical events. Antioch is, is the one of the second most modern cities in the Roman Empire. It's, it's booming. It's, it's, it's almost like you in L.A. or New York City. <laughs> they got the lights, they got the camera, they got the action. It's fancy. It's a big metropolitan city. And in Antioch, many scholars have believed that the Christian faith is divided down the line 50-50, 50% Jews, 50% Greeks. And exactly what takes place now is that Paul says that in Antioch, yeah. me and Paul had a, me and Peter had a confrontation. Come on. Right? I didn't, I, I actually wasn't talking about behind his back, but I went to his face. Yeah. Check this out. The gospel is very controversial. Yes, sir. Right? The gospel isn't, I have a problem with you, so I write you a letter and, and, and pin it on your car. That's not the gospel. This is what Jesus hinted to when he said that if you have an alt with your brother, don't be coming up to the altar asking for prayer. Don't be coming... To, to church, lifting your hands and worship. He said, you need to go to your brother and get it straight. Then once you get it straight, then come back to the altar and give your offering. And that's, and that's really this idea that sometimes we believe that if I avoid conflict, I'm being more like Christ. And that's not the case. So we want to see Paul's motive of why he had to stand up in the midst of this. But nevertheless, he says, I went to his face. Why? Check this out. Because he stood condemned. Remember that. Whenever you leave the gospel, you automatically condemn yourself. Paul didn't condemn him. Peter was already condemned. And because of his love for Peter, he had to address it. And that's sometimes hard, right? Because sometimes I don't want to step on their finger. I don't want to step on their feet. I like, don't want to feel like I'm being judgmental. But if I love you and you are in a position of condemnation and I know you're part of the faith, I like know you know the gospel, I like know where your heart is, I have to tell you to your face. Right? Christianity is living our lives madly in love for each other, brothers and sisters. Yes. But it's also that love is very, very tough. That we have very tough conversations. True. We call you out. True. Right? We hold you accountable. And this is what takes place. Come on. Paul comes to Peter and he said, I call Peter out All because right. he was being bogus. <laughs> My paraphrase, it don't say that. Um, verse 12 why what happens let's get the clarification he said for a certain man came from James he was eating with the Gentiles but when they came he drew back and separated himself fearing the circumcision party let's talk about eating because eating in our case doesn't have social implications as it had back then, right? Listen, I have never got in trouble for eating at Heckey's in Everston. I have never, you know what I'm saying? There's some things that people have came to me and said, Justin, I don't know about your ministry, and you know, you know you're kind of radical, you actually wear your shirts out, you wear t-shirts, you got gym shoes on, right? I had situations like that, but never have I ever had someone say, Justin, I was driving, I was driving in Everston, and I seen you. With barbecue sauce all on your hands, eating ribs with tongue. 
How dare you? Me and my family leaving your church. Exclamation mark, exclamation point, exclamation point. Never happened. Never had someone get mad because I was eating ribs. Never happened. But in this culture, who you eat with is everything. One of, one of the biggest accusations that we see that took place with Jesus happened in Luke chapter 15, verse 2, where the Pharisees came to him and said, he sit with sinners and he eat with them. <laughs> Why? Because who you eat with, you said that they were equal to you. Why? Because cooking was hard back then. You know, in our culture, you know what I'm saying, we are all about cost and speed. What? I can get a burrito for 99 cents with Fritos in it? <laughs> Taco Bell, right? <laughs> this is our culture, right? But back then, you had to wake up early in the morning and start cooking for the evening. I'm saying, there wasn't no refrigerators. <laughs> Everything had to be fresh. <laughs> so the preparation, the labor, the intensity had to come from a place of dedication. So when people ate, what you said was, what is more valuable and important to me, I invite you into that space. So Peter is eating with Gentiles. But not only is he just eating with him, Peter is eating a Gentile diet. Believe it or not, he got bacon on his cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but what takes place is very interesting in this, right? Because he's eating his bacon cheeseburger. It could have helped you understand that Jews do not put to eat pork. So he, he's doing something that's against Jewish culture. And now what takes place is, it says this, before this phrase, before a certain man came from James. These men did not come from James. <laughs> if, if, like, you don't believe me, you can look at the Acts chapter 15, verse 20, 24. When... James and the other apostles said, certain men have came from us and they have disturbed your walk. T telling you about circumcision and all this stuff. We did not tell them not one thing. All right. Listen here. There will be people that say, God told me. Yeah. I have the word. That preachers shouldn't be wearing Jordans in the poor pit. <laughs> Had a word. Because, man, I'm going to take it back to the other thing. People will say, man, I talked to the bishop. He don't approve how you dress, Pastor Justin. It's just, it's just, it's just not appropriate. People would, this is what's taking place, is that these people said, the art, the council, of Jerusalem. Yeah. They don't approve of you, Peter. The crazy part, Peter sat on that council. <laughs> but he came and they said, Peter, and Peter seen him, and check this out. What Peter does is that he picks up his, his plate, he walks over, sit down with the other Jews, and acts like he don't know them anymore. Why? I'm afraid what people are going to think about me. Say it. Okay. I'm afraid that people are going to think I'm a sinner. If I'm sitting with the sinners and, and telling them about the gospel. Listen, do, do you know how many times that the police caught me on the corner <laughs> preaching the gospel to drug dealers? 
I, you know, never in my mind when I wanted, I was thinking, someone would come to my church and say, Justin, I don't know about you. You be hanging with them riffraffs. <laughs> I don't know about his character. He be out there with them drug dealers. Just on the corner, talking. He shouldn't be preaching, no teaching, no kids of mine, right? The implication of who you associate, if you're worried about your reputation, God won't be able to use you in the places that he calls you to be used. Right? So, so what takes place is that they shows up, and the first thing that he do is that he grab all his stuff, he step over, and he separate himself. Why? I'm afraid what they're going to think about me. Because, because there's a negative mindset with associating with Gentiles. The reason why this verse shocks me, two things. First thing, Peter is part of that council. And so Peter would be like, they didn't tell me this. And I know you ain't important because the Bible doesn't even say your name. <laughs> they say certain man. <laughs> So I know you don't got any pool, but nevertheless, the fear of the association gets to him. The second reason why this blows my mind is that God have already had this conversation with Peter. He have already had this conversation with Peter. When we look at the book of Acts, for the first nine chapters, there's only Jewish people. Ain't no one arguing about Bacon or chicken, they only eating chicken. Right? No one is arguing about that. Then in Acts chapter 10, something crazy happened. Well, There's a man named Cornelius. Yes. He is part of the Italian cohort. Very, very powerful man, very prestigious. But the scripture tells us is that he's a God fearer. Fear mean two things, that he give two alms to the poor and he prays day and night. All right. right? So Cornelius is praying one day, an angel shows up. The angel says, your prayers and your giving have caught the attention of God. Wow. He said, do what the angel tell him. I want you to send some men to Joppa, to Simon the Tanner's house. There's a guy named Peter. He has a word for you. Right? The angel leaves. Cornelius says, okay, I'm going to send these people. So he had two faithful so soldiers. He sent them to go get Peter, right? At the same time, Peter is at Simon's the Tanner's house. He goes upstairs to pray. Well, come on. While he's praying on the rooftop, a sheet is lowered down from heaven. Like, I, 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 I also like that before it says that, it said that Peter was hungry. <laughs> you know, his stomach was like, Arr. he was like, Jesus, bless me with some food. Right? He probably said that in his head. What the Bible says, he went to a, a tans. A sheet is lowered down from heaven. And on this sheet, it's, it's a bunch of unclean animals, what he, they would call in their time uncommon. All right? And uh, this is what I want to let you guys see. We're going to look at Acts chapter 10, verse 13. And it says this. So the, the sheet came down, a bunch of unclean animals, and the voice came to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14. But Peter said, by no means, Lord. Hold on. First thing, right? That rise, kill, and eat, if you paid a little bit of money for your Bible, is in red. It's Jesus talking. Right. right? Jesus is talking. We know it's Jesus because Peter says, Lord, when he responds back to it. The question is, why is Peter arguing with God? No, what? Talk to, no, I can't do that. Oh. By no means, Lord. For I have never eaten 
anything that is common or unclean. Verse 16. This happened three times. So, listen. Peter says, no, I never eat it. Jesus says, eat. He says, no, I never eat it. Jesus said, eat. He said, no, I never, come on, fool. It's something about Peter in this number three. It's almost like his brain don't click into the third. Oh, I get it. <laughs> and the voice came, it happened three times. And then the second time he says, what God has made clean, do not call common. All right. This happened three times. And things, then the things was taken up, up into heaven once again. Right? Check this out. This is what happened. Verse 17. Now, while Peter was in a trying complex as to what the vision has that he had seen might mean, behold, the man who was sent to him by Cornelius, having made an inquiry of Simon's house, stood at the gate. Right? So Simon said, Hey, Peter. It's some soldiers down here. I don't know what you did. Come down here, check them out, right? So Peter comes downstairs, right? He calls them out. He, they, they actually talk to Peter. What takes place is that Peter now says, okay, I, I think it's making sense now, right? God probably just want me to go to this house and actually talk to this person. Cool. Got it. We actually see this, that he, he walks into the uh, Cornelius' house. We're going to pick up at verse 28. He says this. And he said to them, you yourself know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate it with or to visit any one of another nation. All right. But God have shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Listen, this is what's taking place. Peter's saying, hey, social-wise, this is a bad look. But what God just showed me, and me and God just had a debate about, is that he, he's doing something new. So Peter tells him, hey, I, I probably shouldn't be doing this, but nevertheless, I'm just going to preach the gospel. What takes place is that Peter starts preaching the gospel. Peter goes in. He starts preaching the gospel. He, he's telling Cornelius and his whole house about Jesus and the power of Jesus. He's preaching. And look what happened in verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Mm -hmm. Verse 45. And the believers from among the circumcision who had came with Peter. So Peter didn't go by himself because he was like, I'm going to have some, some witnesses that I was still a Jew, Jewish when I went there. So no one see me walking out the house. They could say I did something in there I didn't do. So he brought his witnesses. But check this out. While he's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on the house. And get the Holy Spirit fell in these Gentile people's lives. Glory. And the people who were circumcised, who came with Peter, are amazed. Yes. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on Gentiles. I'm always perplexed when people are amazed by what the Bible have already predicted. Mm -hmm. Come on, it is... Peter, first sermon, he quoted the book of Joel that God will pour out his spirit on all. Oh. But now I'm confused. Gentiles too? I just thought he was just going to pour out people who look like me. I just thought he was going to pour out people who had similar convictions as me. So they confused. They confused. But how did they know that they had the Holy Spirit? Well, come on. 
Were they just acting good? No. Look at verse 46. For they heard them speaking in tongues and exhorting God. So this is how they know. They didn't say, say oh, it just seemed like you guys got the Holy Spirit. That's not how they knew. They had an all-out Holy Ghost revival in Cornelius' house. Then Peter declared, you know, this is my apostolic moment. <laughs> he said, can anyone withhold water for baptism these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He asked the question. Everybody was quiet in the house. Verse 40, 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Hey. Then they asked him to remain some days. So check this out. Peter baptized them. And right after he baptized them, they said, let's have a festival. Hang out. Let's chill. Right. Peter said, God doing a new thing. Man, I never tried bacon on my cheeseburger. Let me try that. Right. <laughs> right? So listen, he now got the revelation. He's relaxed. He's chilling. He's doing everything that he feel the freedom of the Holy Spirit have given him. Now he got to go back to Jerusalem. Right? Let's see what takes place. This happened in chapter 11, verse 2, in the, book, the same book of Acts. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, verse number 3, you went to the uncircumcised men, and you ate with them. <laughs> You had bacon on your cheeseburger, and you supposed to be Petros the Rock. If you keep reading, and, and if you read chapter 11, you will see Peter goes in on him. He says, hey, I will, I, Jesus sent me there. I preached the gospel. The Holy Spirit fell. I baptized in the name of Jesus. What do I supposed to say? God, you don't supposed to work like this? Just shut up, idiots. I'm paraphrasing. The Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit can do. All right. So listen, Peter had this argument before. He had this argument before. He had the argument of this whole idea is that Jews and Gentiles are supposed to be the same. He had this argument. But there's something about this idea that when people are being very hypocritical, it's sometimes contagious. It's, 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 it sometimes can even rub off people who know. So, so look at this. Um, let's go back to Galatians. We want to um, go to chapter 2. We want to pick it up in, in verse 13. And it said this, And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. So, listen, this is what's taking place. Peter is now acting hypocritically. So even that Barnabas was led astray by the hypocrisy. Wow. What takes place is that Peter gets up and moves over, and now everybody confused. Say it. Wait, what's going on? I thought it was okay. Is it not okay? I don't know. I don't want to get in trouble, right? So everyone is confused Come on. and trying to act like I don't know the Gentiles. What's going on? Come on. Listen, hypocrisy is contagious, period. If you hang around a lot of people who are hypo who is hypocrites, I don't care how much you are on fire for Jesus, you're going to become a hypocrite. Right. Why? Because something inside of us bends towards those who you are around. Have you ever dated someone and they said something all the time and that over time you just start saying what they say? You actually start sounding like them. Why? Because of the closeness of who you are. 
And I really believe that if you find yourself around people who are not on fire for Jesus, who not pursuing Jesus, you're going to be very dull. Single people, listen. Listen, single people, this is for you. If you're on fire for Jesus, and the person you're getting ready to date is not on fire for Jesus, well. someone's going to pull us on one. And I'm letting you know today, based on the gospel, it's easier for a sinner to pull a Christian than a Christian to pull a sinner. Come on. Period. Why? It's something inside of us that is broken. Yeah. It's broken. Why? Listen. If I'm living a Christian life that requires the Holy Spirit, and a person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit is walking with me, they're going to say, why can't we just do what we want to do? Because, you know, that's not going to honor God. You're going to either separate or say, hmm, you need to get saved. No, my life's pretty good. Okay, you're going to just fall over. It happens. All right. Listen, listen, this is why I am so love this verse, right? Because if Peter and Barnabas can be saved from their hypocrisy, so can us. Listen, listen. Once you take your eyes off of Jesus and you no longer focus on Jesus, you drift. You're going to drift. There is no, is it going to happen? When is it going to it's going to happen, period. Why? Why? Peter is by far the most boldest disciple I have ever seen in Scripture when his eyes is fixed on Jesus. I got three examples. I'm going to knock you out. Three examples of when Peter is eyes fixed on Jesus, take his eyes off of Jesus, and he become a, a punk. Right? All right? Happens, right? Example number one, there's a storm. All right. they in a boat. Yes. Water is coming on the boat. Come on. Jesus come walking on the water. Yeah. Right? Many times when people hear that Jesus is walking in water, people think he's walking on a smooth lake. It's a, it's a hurricane. All right. <laughs> the waves are huge. They're crashing. Peter, I, isn't worrying about the storm. He's looking at Jesus, and he said, if that be you, Lord, call me, and I'll come forth. Bow. Eyes fixed on Jesus. What the Bible tells us that Peter is now walking on water, and as soon as he takes his eyes off of Jesus, he begins to sink. Eyes on Jesus, boldness. Eyes off of Jesus, drifting. Amen. Example number two. Right? Peter is sitting at the last supper. Right? His eyes are fixed on Jesus. Jesus is telling them, I'm about to die. In a short time, I'm not going to be along with you. Peter's eyes is fixed on Jesus. He says, even I must die with you, Lord. Jesus was like, bro, you ain't there yet, but nevertheless, <laughs> his eyes are fixed on Jesus, and he's on fire for Jesus. I'm ready to die. Let's go. He's looking at Jesus in his face. He's fixed. Jesus is arrested. They're scattered. Peter is walking. Someone says, aren't you a Galilean? No, I'm not no Galilean. But you got an accent like you from Galilee. I'm not Galilee. A little girl's like, but I seen you with Jesus. Blinkity, blinkity, blink. <laughs> Eyes fixed on Jesus, I die for you. Eyes not fixed on Jesus, I don't know the man. <laughs> when your eyes are fixed on Jesus, there's a boldness that's come out. Right? 
Example number three. Peter backslid. <laughs> He's fishing with the disciples. Jesus shows up. He reconciles them. They, they actually had this conversation. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Right? They, they, they go through this dialogue. You know what I'm saying? Peter, I fix on Jesus. I will feed your sheep, dear Lord. They, they begin walking, and Peter says, what about John? Yeah, sure Jesus was like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> what does John have to do with this? You do what? Listen. When your eyes fixed on Jesus, Come on. it's very hard for you to get distracted. It's the devil's job. Listen, when the gospel is preached, the devil going to send church folks. Come on. Church folks are going to come. Like, trust me, I drift. I'm going to give you my personal testimony. I was free wearing flip-flops <laughs> in the Lord. I was free as ever. Woo! God is good. Put on my shorts, put on my flip-flops, come to church. <laughs> Got around those church folks, they was like, he don't wear suits. <laughs> what type of minister is that? <laughs> I showed up to the next service with a full suit on. <laughs> listen, listen, why? Why? It's in you. It's in you to want to measure up. And the devil knows it. The devil knows that when God frees you up and you're like, I'm free, I'm free, and people start to criticize, you're going to get scared and conform. Even though the word has already transformed you, you're going to get scared and you're going to conform. Listen. This is why you have to fix your eyes on Jesus. This is why, first point, you have to preach the gospel to yourself every day. All right. You got to wake up and say, I'm free. I'm a sinner. I'm jacked up. But Jesus died for my sins. And as long as I'm pursuing him, I'm good. Amen. Nothing else matters. If I'm pursuing Christ, I'm good. So when someone says, but he don't wear a suit, I'm good. <laughs> oh, he like pray, he like preach with no organ. I'm good. I'm not trying to find my identity in other people. I'm not looking for your definition of what a a apostolic pastor look like or sound like. Amen. All right, come on. Listen, I don't, I'm not sitting there, am I an apostolic? I don't question my doctrine. Just because I don't wear a white shirt and a black tie. Your relationship. Come on, man. I had a couple of them say, oh, but you have facial hair. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Why? I know the gospel. I know the gospel. But check this out. I'm not so arrogant that I, my confidence in myself. I surround myself around people of the gospel who can tell me when I'm drifting away from the gospel. All right. All right. If I'm Peter, I find me a Paul. So that they can call me out. They can look at me and say, Justin, why are you wearing a suit? And I'll be like, because this is what preachers do. <laughs> and they say, but that's not you. That's not how God designed you. Listen, transparent moment. W when I first started preaching, I had a hoop. You might say, what is a hoop, Pastor Justin? I used to go, <gasps> When God talking, he move. I used to preach like that with the organ and everything. 
your neighbor. I feel it, right? I used to preach like that. I used to preach like that. And so one of my friends in the gospel looked at me and said, that's not you. You, You're trying to fit in. And God has called you to stand out. I'm telling you, if you're not careful. Listen, many times people think that the biggest threat to your Christian salvation is outside in the world. No, it's hypocritic Christians in the church. They will corrupt your Christianity and you won't even know. Why? You'd be having a conversation with them and you say, you remember I had the whole book of Romans? Oh man, I got to go home and practice. What? You evangelized to 20 people this week? Oh man, I got to go out there and start evangelizing people. Why? You instantly start to compare your, your walk where other people walk in Christ saying, I didn't call you to be like them. I called you to be you. Amen. I called you to speak to your people group. Right? And it's, and, it's, and it's very, very dangerous. Listen, above all things, guard your heart. Amen. I'm telling you, guard your heart. If you find yourself seeking approval, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this as close to my heart as possible. If you find yourself seeking approval for any person, even the pastors and the elders in this church, check yourself. Check yourself. Check yourself. (laughs) Thanks, Tiana. (laughs) Right? You have to really say to yourself, Why? Because listen, I have a preference. It's certain music I like. It's certain ways I like to dress. It's it's certain way I like to preach. Right? I don't want no minister or any preacher in our church feel like I had to preach like Justin. They start showing up with Jordan's and T-shirts on. (laughs) Be you. Listen, this is what the gospel does. The gospel didn't come to overwrite you. The gospel came to amplify the God that's in you. This is why I'm totally against a dress code at church. Why? Because if the Holy Spirit is in you, it's going to tell you how to dress. Right. That was probably the longest intro, and I need to <laughs> deal with the argument that if someone is to preach the gospel, that someone is going to do what they want to do. Right. Let's look at verse 14. He says, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cyphus before them all. Listen, he didn't pull them over in the corner. He said it to him so everyone can hear it. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like a Jew? This is what he said. I'm like not going to spend a lot of time in this latter part. He said, Peter, you can't even live like a Jew. You eat bacon on your cheeseburger every week. I watch you, bro. So how do you expect if you born a Jewish person is struggling to live that lifestyle. Expecting someone who comes from a totally secular lifestyle to fit in. Listen, I'm about to really clarify this because, you know, Jew, Gentile thing, it gets you confused. You, Peter, a church baby, a pure baby, born and raised in the church, you're struggling to be a church kid. How do you expect someone who just was a drug dealer to be a church kid and you're struggling and you've been doing it your whole life? What takes place is Peter repents and he goes back eating his bacon cheeseburger. 
right? But listen, the gospel was preached, and there's something I want to draw a thing. He says this, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Listen, check this out. People say that if you, the gospel, if it's your faith alone and there is no performance requirement, people are going to sin, they're going to be doing whatever they want. And I would say, yes, it's true. They are. People are going to hear the gospel. They want to misinterpret it as grace for Greece. <laughs> they could slip in and slip out whenever they want. They're going to interpret that way. But this is what I know about the gospel. It's not the truth of the gospel. Anyone who hears the gospel and, and, and hears it as it's a get out of jail free card never met the person of Jesus Christ. That's right. They don't even know the gospel. This is why John said it like this. Those who was part of us, who went out from us, was never part of us. I'm paraphrasing what he said in 1 John. This is what he's saying. There is no such thing as backsliding. What? Oh, man. The emails are going to come. <laughs> Justin Williams at graceandtruth.org. I would love to debate this. There is no such thing as backsliding. There is no such thing. If a person walk away from Jesus, they never knew Jesus. All right. Right. That's true. So hard. Listen, if you met Jesus, I'm telling you, you don't want to leave. You don't want to leave. You don't want to leave. And if you did leave, you're coming back. Right. Prodigal sons, classic example. Right. That's why Jesus told that story. If you leave, you're coming back. Why? Because you want to sit there and say, why well, I'm eating with the pigs when my father has a house well, full of man. servants. Man. Why? You have to know the love of Christ. You have to know the love of Christ. Right? I want to I wanna, I wanna say this last verse because this verse helps me every time the devil comes and lies to me. And what the devil lies and he says is that Christ want to take things from you. Christ want to take your fun away. He like don't want you to be a young person. You know, as a young person growing up in the church, this is a verse that amplified to keep me holy and keep me in the church. This is the verse, Romans 8, 31. He says this. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32, he says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us only things that the Bible says, only things that your church family thinks is is appropriate? All things. Listen. Listen, as a young person growing up in the church, yes, I liked it. Girls. I was a teenage boy. Just because you got the Holy Spirit don't mean your hormones don't work. All right, keep it real. But what kept me safe? All things. All things. Right? Right, I had to tell myself, if Christ died for me, hmm, he'd give me a girlfriend. I don't even got to figure it out. I don't have to go looking for it. No, it's through God. Oh. Do you know the love of God? It's through God? Do you know the love of God? Because if you don't know the love of God, you're going to always be pursuing other things outside of his love. Right. Mm-hmm. If it's money, mm-hmm. if it's sex, if it's fame, if it's power, if it's safety, if you don't know the love of Christ. And the reason why a lot of people are not saved is not because they don't hear the gospel. The reason why so many people have walked away from the faith is not that they didn't hear the gospel. They never knew the love of Christ. All right. They probably knew church. They actually probably knew the, the church people in the church loved them, but they never knew the love of Christ. This is my prayer for you, us today. 
is that you guys know the love of Christ. You have to know the love of Christ. That's the only thing that's going to save you. Why? There will be trouble. Jesus said it out of his own mouth. But fear not. He said, what? I pray for you. (laughs) Why? This is ideal. If I don't know Christ is near to me and close to me, I'm going to walk away. I'm going to backslide. And when I walk away, I'm going to tell everybody, yeah, I used to be a Christian. It ain't nothing to it. Every time I hear that foolishness, I'll say, you never knew Christ. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I never knew, you, you never knew Christ. Listen, I'm not preaching once saved, always saved. What I'm preaching is once you met Christ, you in love. All right. Listen, Christ ain't no B-roll data. He's going to lay it out. He's going to rule you into salvation. Amen. Amen. Right? So, listen, if a person hears the gospel and they live a life of sinning, they don't know Jesus. Yeah. I don't care what title they have. I don't care how long they've been in church. If they're practicing sin, they don't know Jesus. I'm not saying that they're tripping and falling once a year, once every blue moon. If they constantly practicing right. sin, they right. don't know Jesus. They don't know Jesus. And, and my heart is to pray for them. Because yeah. a lot of people who are going to get to heaven and say, Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. Right. I did all these great feats in your name. Did you look at my tithes and offering? Did you look at the ministries that I helped build in the church? He going to look at him and say, I don't know you, dude. I don't. Listen, if I'm up here preaching an hour plus and I don't know Christ, this don't go on no, no book as extra credit. I go to hell. This is serious. And and it's so close to my heart because I really want you guys to understand that you can't fake your way into heaven. No. Don't fool God. You either know him or you don't. Don't fool God. All right. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, God, God, I just thank you, God, for being a God of action. God, I I just thank you, God, for being a God to understand and transform us, God. Father God, I ask you to pray, God, that as we are pursuing you, God, from our hearts and our minds, God, that, Father God, that you're working on our hearts to really show us, are we really truly seeking you? Father God, I ask you to pray that you expose any motive that we have that's not like you. Any motive. Father God, I, Father God, I ask you to pray that you uproot anything that we learned in church that's not like you. Pull it up. Because God, we don't know what reads is choking the life that you're trying to birth out of us. Father God, I ask you to pray, God, that those who don't know Christ, God, that might hear in this for the first time and say, I never heard that message. I never knew that, God. I never experienced that. Because God, that they might understand how beautiful you are. And their heart would be willing to come and try and see that you're good. Father God, I actually pray, God, that they might not just be converted, but yet they might be persuaded to live a life that dedicated to Christ. Father God, I actually pray, God, that our hearts, our minds, and our soul, God, might always be pointed to you. That our hearts and our and, and how we walk and how we talk, God, might be pointed to you. So that you might get glory from us. Father God, I ask you, pray, God, that you continue to keep us, that you continue to guard us. Father God, I ask you, pray, God, that you be the anchor that keep us from drifting. That, Father God, that you be the anchor that keep us from drifting. Father God, I ask you, pray, that we place our hope in you, we place our faith in you. And, Father God, most of them, poor, important, 
that we place our love in you. God, I thank you for what you're doing. Father God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 If anybody wants to pray, I will be up here. Next steps. Let's do next steps, Robbie, real quick. Um, there's, there's three steps that we have at Grace and Truth. Here you go. The first step is that you can come chat with us. Um, just have a conversation. Ask us about what I just preached. I would love to unpack in scripture or any text. I would even love to unpack your your old church experience with you. I'm a church kid. I grew up in the church. Right? I have seen some crazy stuff. I have, I have heard some crazy things across the pulpit. I have heard that that you ran jogging pants are going to send you to hell, young ladies. Right? I heard everything. Right? I'm here to sit there and help you unpack it and really make sure that you know the gospel and what the scriptures and the Bible really say. So come have a conversation with us. Right? Um, I actually say that we have ministers um, we have Michelle, Elder Planbeck, Evangelist Sunday, Pastor Sunday. If you want to talk to anyone, even Deaconess Dawkins back there, she got the scripture. But, but if, if you just want to talk to anyone, please feel free to talk to her, right? If you're online, we have a chat feature. Chat with us. We want to talk. We want to make sure that you understand what it means to be saved and that you're not alone. That, that leads us to Step number two, join a group. Listen, trying to be a Christian by yourself is hard. Right? You can be a fake Christian by yourself. It's possible. But really trying to do this thing legit is difficult. It's difficult. This is why the scripture tells us, do not forsake the assemblies of the brother. There's a secret strength in biblical community. They are the ones that tell you that you're drifting. They are the one that calls you out and stands you in your face and says, you're not doing it the right way no more. Join a group. Man, we got three groups. Women, a bunch of godly women, praying, <laughs> talking. Listen, Wednesday morning, I wake up some mornings with... T- and my wife just going in from the Lord with the women of the church. They just praying. They seeking God early in the morning. Be a part of that. That's awesome. Right? We got a man group, right? Man up. We are talking some serious things, having some really heart-to-heart things, unpacking some really things about manhood. And at the end of all of that conversation that we have, we go in. Brother Robbie be praying. He be, he be going in, trying to cover us, making sure that we secure. Wait, you want to be a part of that. You want to be a part of something that is just not me. Out here reading the Bible, trying to figure it out. But I have people I can lean into and say, man, I need help. Man, this week been a hard week. And everyone cannot beat you up, but can lean into you and love you back to grace. And the last thing. Join a team. Maybe after you had a chat and you saved, you baptized, and you're part of the group, God is calling you to do something amazing in, the, in this world. I don't know where God is pulling your heart and telling you what to serve in, but our church has a lot of programs that we would love for you to serve, to have to be used, to be activated into ministry. Right? Join the group. Have a conversation with me. If we don't have a ministry for that, talk to me. Our church is very flexible. We can help create a ministry for you. We would love to see everyone actively in ministry and actually doing something for the kingdom. I, I love you guys, and I'll see you next week.